Welcome to the Mindset RX podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and I help functional athletes gain a champ's mindset. On today's show, I'm bringing you one of the shows or a replay of the show because I'm I'm currently, well, currently away. I'm currently sitting in my in my uh, in my flat, but whilst you're listening to this, I'm away. So this episode is a one of the, another really enjoyable episode that I think will really help you phrase uh, or, or frame the world of CrossFit in a completely different way. And it's with the legend that is, and if you can hear seagulls, I can apologize. It's with the legend that is Julian Bono. Um, Julian is uh, a real inspiration to me personally and, uh, and to Mindset RX as well. And I'm quite happy to say that my Set RX wouldn't be where it is now if it wasn't for Julian's help. So enjoy the show. Um, and of course, if you enjoy it that much, go ahead and leave a five star review. Good. Thank you for having me again. No worries. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to have you on. And it's, it's probably a good time to say that anyone who hasn't listened to the sh- um, our previous show, um, you can head over to alphamoveco slash Julian and you shall, you shall see it there and listen to it there. Um, I think the, one of the things that's happened since our last show and, um, and now is the CrossFit Games. Yeah. So why don't you um, start off with kind of what your biggest lessons that you learned from the CrossFit Games were? Um, well, how... Um, the di- really, what, what I saw was the difference between intensity and volume. Okay. Well, uh, I think there is a... Um, like, at least in the States, I'm guessing from what I saw, it's a little bit the same in Europe. There is... Uh, a certain trend to, toward uh, volume in training. And because uh, I saw a lot of programming where really it seems pe- like a lot of people are selling programming now online and everything. And they seem to be pushing toward volume. And I can tell you from, from the games that it's just not, not the point. Like um, there was a workout, for example, like I remember like Garrett Fisher, his legs got sore out of the 40 box jumps, 20 uh, D-ball over the shoulder because he pushed the pace so hard, like he felt it in his leg the next day and everything. And 40 box jumps is nothing, you know what I mean, for those mm-hmm. guys. That's something if they, if they go at 90, you know, 95%, they can do this all day. But he pushed the intensity so hard that he created really some, uh, some soreness and some, you know, like he felt his legs a lot, yeah. basically. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And that would be the... The biggest lesson for me, which is something I always believed anyway, but it was like more like a confirmation, is that the key of training is pushing intensity, not volume. Okay. The volume will not help you at the games because if you look even on a hard days, it was like three workouts max. Like I see all those guys working five, six times a day. You don't have to do that at the games. You'll do two, maybe three workouts. If you do three workouts, they'll be sure, but you're going to push intensity so high. That's what's going to gonna mess you up not the volume. Yeah. So how's that changed your approach to programming in, um, in intense or how have you, have you, you, yeah. How have you changed your programming in, in light of that? Uh, I'm not going to change it because it kind of confirmed what I always believed, which was, uh, it's, uh, it's actually what Tommy Hackenbrook said is that you don't need to do harder workouts. You just need to do, to go harder in your workouts, okay. which is, I, I think he's completely right on that is the key for me, and I see it more and more and more, is just to don't add sets, don't add training sessions, just leave the floor completely destroyed. When it comes down, when it comes to pushing the intensity in your workout, if you are able to, let's say you have a workout program for intensity, right? If you are able to talk to anybody within the next, the next 10 minutes after the workout, if you are not on the ground wishing you were dead at that moment, you are not training. If you are, if you, again, if like I see those people, they have like uh, uh, what is supposed to be a hard workout and then they're all talking about it after and everything. I was like, you guys are crazy because when I do my, my sled workouts with the prowler and everything, I can't, it's not that I don't want to talk to you. It's just that I can't talk to you. Right now it takes me 10 minutes to realize whether I'm dead or alive because I'm not really sure. And I'm not sure which one is worse, honestly. Like I might want to be dead at that moment. And like, I, I remember I had some sleds workout where literally I would, uh, that, that happened to me once at Invictus where I went by a tree and I laid down because I didn't know how to stop my legs from cramping. And I didn't know what to do. There was not a position that was comfortable. They were, I, just, I just didn't know what to do. So I just lay there trying to go into, a, not a happy place, but maybe a little bit less miserable. 
Yeah. Then the 10 minutes that took me to, for the cramping to go away. But I was like, what the fuck? Um, you know, and so I was, but okay, that's training for you. you know I mean, and then honestly, the entire time, there was part of my head where I was like, oh, you pussy, you had another one in you. <laughs> so, but so that idea that you're going to have those hard workouts and just, you know, talk to your friends after. I was like, that was good. I did sweat that day. Um, that's not a training session. Yeah. And so I'm not saying maybe it's every day, but like you should have those training at least once a week, maybe twice a week where really you wonder why you're doing this. Is, do you reckon that's something that's pre-programmed in someone's mind, their ability to push themselves that hard? Or do you reckon you can develop it over time? You can develop it, totally. It's mental toughness. That's what this is. I mean, don't get me wrong. You got to be a little bit sick in the head to want to push that hard. But most people who train those sports, it's like jiu-jitsu and everything. It is an extreme. If you're going to go to the CrossFit Games, it's an extreme sport. You're not doing yourself any good by going to the Games. Chances are you're going to fuck yourself up really bad somewhere and it's going to take you a month to recover. Lauren Fisher still is not training hard. I mean, and so you look at it like an extreme sport. Nobody does an extreme sport for like, oh, it's good for me. I mean, like if you go into an MMA and go like, yeah, because I like what you you know, like it's good for my abs. I kind of lose some weight there. You got issues, dude. So uh, it, it's the sad, but even for people like that, that like to train, most most people that do those types of, of uh, that go, they like to go to a pain cave already have the mindset after just developing uh, mental toughness. And after that, I just think it's a mental game of dealing with frustration. Yeah. Like, you know, like, but what I like about like, like I had a very good training session today with the, the groups here in Utrecht. Uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm trying to pronounce it right, in uh, Holland, right? And there was a girl at the end, like, the, she couldn't do the sled. The, the sled kept tilting over and everything. And she was like, it's the sled. I was like, no, it's you. It's never the sled. <laughs> I mean, it's never. The, I, I got news for you. It's never the sled. It's you. But the key is uh, all that stuff, that's just mental toughness. That's mental, not even toughness. That's mental preparation. I mean, like, you got to learn. The, all this is learned behavior. I mean, like. You got to start developing workouts where you put yourself in that moment where you're like, you want to blame everybody in the world for what's happening, but not you. No, you're failing. So all this to me is just mental preparation. You can develop that. Like you can see that in the military all the time. Nobody comes tough enough to be a SEAL. This is something they train into people's mind. I mean, so, so do you have, sorry, do you finished then? You had no, the like, okay. Um, do you have any specific ways aside from the workouts themselves to try and develop that prep, um, that mental toughness and that, that preparation? Well, honestly, I do think this is not something you're going to develop once a week. I think it's an entire mindset when it comes to training. And to me, a lot of it is um, controlling negativity. Where and, and I talk about always the difference between intensity and pain. And that's an important one, understanding that uh, it, the basic for me of all that stuff, and that goes way past training, it would be something I would explain to, let's say, someone wanting to go in the military just the same, is first of all understanding the difference between intensity and pain. That, you can, that what you think is pain many times is only intensity in the sense of there is no physical damage, structurally speaking, being done to your body. So, like, if you push a sled, what, you're not destroying anything. There is very low skill involved, very low eccentric, and it's very low weight-bearing. I call that the SEW, right? So, once you have a very low SEW, you are not really infecting, uh, inflicting any structural damage to the body. So, there is no really pain associated with that. What you are feeling is intensity, which is not the same thing. It's your head telling you to quit. It's not your body telling you. You can always push that prior to two more steps, always. So what's telling you to quit is your head. So the basic of all this to me is, first of all, and, but like truly understanding the difference between intensity and pain. And after that is, and it, that's not something you do once a week, is that whole thing about not letting your mind defeat you. And that's something that goes through blocking negativity in your training. For example, a simple way that you can do that is even on no, any workout, anytime you are at the gym, is you're not allowed to say, I suck. You're not, you're not allowed to, look, to do a, a workout and go, I hate this. I'm not going to be good at this. 
like never, 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 ever be negative or anything. Like you always try to go, no, I can, you know, like being toward a positive message. So I think it's really something you don't train once a week. I think it's something you train, but even in your life, everyday life, all the time, basically. You always have two choices. You can look at it in a positive way or in a negative way. Mm. That's up to, that is something you can control. That is up to you. Exactly. I, I completely agree. You, you spoke then about sleds, as, um, as, I, as I know you enjoy doing. Um, there's something we didn't actually cover last time. We spoke about like, the concept of sleds, but we didn't say exactly how you choose to use them um, and the, kind of the different ways that sleds can be used to get, um, to get, to get the desired results. So, so how do you utilize sleds in your training? So I was talking about the SEW. It's a very interesting, it's a very important concept to me. So SEW stands for skill eccentric and weight bearing, right? And so to me, the lower that combination is, the higher you can push the intensity. It's a simple concept, really. It's like, let's say, uh, back squat. Back squat is somewhat skill, right? There is uh, some amount of it's eccentric and it's, it's weight bearing. Yeah. So if I push the intensity too high, on a movement like the squat, I'm going to, and let's say I do, you know, like sets of 100 reps at body weight, which is interesting to do, by the way. But, um, I couldn't. Yeah. I think at 70, I died. I'm a, um, but let's say I do that every day or every two days, my knees are not going to survive. My back is not going to survive. I mean, so there is always a moment where the skill, first of all, is going to stop me from pushing intensity. If it's not the skill, it's the eccentric because I'm spending too much time, too much energy toward this century. Mm-hmm. And if you know that, the weight-bearing equation is going to result in structural damage, which is going to create pain, which and every time there is actual pain, that reduces the intensity. So the key for me in order to bring the intensity very high is to have a low SEW. And that's where the sled comes in. Because the sled has no skill, you're pushing, so hard, or dragging, how hard can it be? There's no eccentric, you're only pushing forward, right? You're never resisting. And it's no, not weight-bearing. So there's absolutely no reason to push that sled to more steps. You are not going to hurt your knee. You're not going to hurt your back, I mean, because it's not on you. And uh, there's absolutely no eccentric, which means the energy only goes toward the concentric phase. Um, so all energy is being put toward taking another step forward or backwards, whatever. And so what, again, is your reason to stop? You have none. And so with that low uh, SEW, I can push the intensity physical and mental as far as I want. And so to me, the sled is a perfect work, perfect tool for intensity because it obeys that principle of SEW. And so uh, the airdyne would be another one, for example, that works well. That's why it's so bad. And everything is just, I can do more things with a sled than I can with an airdyne. Yeah. And that being said, the airdyne is awesome. Like the rower, for example, rowing, there is some skill involved. You know what I mean? And there is a little bit of eccentric because of the coming back movement and everything. So, mm. uh, but it's still a great tool for intensity. It's just, I think the sled, in, in, if, I, if I start to have categories, if you go, uh, the lowest SCW I can find is the, is the sled. So that's why I like them so much. So something that's just occurred to me is, um, is what if you were going to have three three to five pieces of kiss in the gym what would you what would you have them equipment yeah i would have a sandbags i would have a sled a rope and a yoke okay why um the sandbag because i can do about anything i can press it i can squat it uh it's a very functional movement in the sense of that uh when they say functional movement usually they don't understand what it what they mean by that it's really supposed to mimic everyday uh, life and I'm not talking necessarily in society here I'm talking about like if you're in a jungle what are the movements you're going to use mm-hmm. you're going to pick up a rock you're going to have to carry that rock to go build your house those kinds of functional movement a sandbag uh, mimics all of those and it's user friendly because you can drop it you can press it a stone is not, is not as nice so uh, I love the sandbags for all this it also it helps with internal rotation but that, that's a longer conversation um uh, a rope because then I get to pull uh, the sled, right? So the sled, I love. What I love to do is I love to to sprint with it. I love to drag it backwards. I love to put like a harness on my shoulders and uh, bear crawl it with a weight attached behind me. Yeah. I like to I like to pull it with a rope. 
And so that, that's a great, with, all, with basically those four things, I can do about any muscle in your body, so I like it. The rope, I can also hook it up somewhere and, and do, you know, uh, rope climbs, which is always great. And the yoke, because I can actually uh, put weight on my structure. I can press it, I can carry it, and then I can carry it on my back and squat it if I want to. And I can put a tremendous uh, overload on my structure by uh, walking a yoke, which has really, really great benefits for the body because I overload my structure, but at the same time without putting too much uh, pressure on the knees and stuff like that. So it's, it's a great exercise. I, I really like that as well because it's, it's so far away from a commercial gym. It's like the opposite of a commercial gym. Yeah, I don't do too, yeah, all that stuff. That's always, it's a little bit of an issue because sometimes when I want to train, not everybody has the equipment. Mm. But, uh, man, just give me 100 feet, give me 30, 40 meters, give me those things, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Basically fix anybody with that. So, yeah, that's all I need. Nice. So you kind of, you alluded to the fact you're on your, your world tour at the moment, um, doing some seminars. Um, and before we get into exactly what's, um, what's involved in the seminars and kind of into what you're teaching, what's, um, how's, your, how's your training and nutrition been affected? Uh, my training has been really good, actually. Like, yeah. so, uh, two weeks, so I was on vacation for 10 days. We went to Mexico. There was a CrossFit gym there, so we started training. It was like, uh, I don't know, like 50 degrees every day, so I sweated nonstop for 10 days. But um, then we came back. I went to the Invictus camp in Belgium. Yeah. So I trained in Belgium. I went to Paris for five days to show my daughter where I grew up. But I managed to train there as well, so that was cool. Back to Belgium, trained, and now I'm in Holland right now. And we've been training every day. So my, my training has been good. My nutrition has, has gravitated toward a lot of Belgian chocolate. <laughs> nice. This has been Nutella. They have the, whatever, whatever they call pancakes here, which is really crepes. Yeah. They've been that too. Been, the bread in Paris was awesome. <laughs> so there's a lot of bread and butter over there. I've been drinking about 17 coffees a day because it tastes, everything tastes so good. There's been a few pain au chocolat, a few croissants. Uh, is, the, my nutrition has been right on point. It's been awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm bulking phase. I'm not great too because I walk everywhere. So <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me laugh. You're, um, you spend so much time in the States, but you're so European at heart. <laughs> and now that I'm back, like eating that food, I was like, oh man, I'm back to my very healthy breakfast of croissant and espresso. Pain chocolat, really, and espresso. I just went right back into it, man. It's awesome. Oh, it's a beautiful way to start the day. I meal a day where I just pound everything, and then it's intermittent fasting. That's how I call it. Yeah. <laughs> I do that totally on purpose because I, I read that book the other day, and so I started a diet of intermit, intermittent fasting. That's what I'm doing. Really. That's the justification between all the stuff. On a serious note, the, the intermittent fasting is working exceptionally well for myself. at It's working, working, working for me right now. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. I think there's... Um, there's I'm a, doing it, but it's working for me right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the, in the seminars themselves, how do you... Like obviously, you've, you've got so much, so much knowledge and so much you, you could teach people. And it's like, I know like, I'm, I'm planning a few speaking events now and there's just so much like, that you could tell people. How do you choose the the one, two, three subjects that you expand on? Because I talk about principles always, not methods. So people always want to gravitate toward methods because what they're really asking is, how can you fix me? Mm. How can you do this for me? And from the get-go, I was very clear about the fact that I will not tell you what to do. I will tell you how to do it. And so, you know, that's that quote from Ralph Emerson. Uh, there are very, very few principles, really. Uh, out there there's a million methods and there's a quote about all this um and so i try not to go to again to our pe telling people what to do i try to tell them how to do it the why and the how and not focusing on the what so much so there are certain things because i have a certain experience coaching that i know works and so whenever they ask me like a specific application of what i'm talking about i try to give them some example but again i don't try to make the seminars about training too much and make people do rope pulls. I think it's a great exercise, but there's a reason why I think it's a great exercise. And I, I'm going to spend a lot more time explaining why it's a great exercise that, it, that I'm going to spend showing you how to do it, basically, because it's not that complicated of a movement anyway. But I really try to educate. That's the key for me is those seminars are for education. I try to educate people to make them think correctly on how to approach a problem to our training. Mm. 
So basically, I'm trying to teach them how to fish, and I'm not there to give them a, a fish. That's really what I'm trying to do. So that narrows down a little bit the, the list of things. Now, that being said, people always ask me, you know, like uh, specific questions about how to deal with certain things. But hopefully over time, I can educate people that they start figuring out themselves how to do this based on the principles I'm talking about. Well, that's a sign of a good coach, I think, um, being able to do that. Um, you have to do it. Okay. So you've spoken as well on your on your vlog, uh, which is I definitely recommend. It's, it's genuinely enjoyable con- uh, content to watch uh, compared to some of the vlogs out there. It's, it's really, really good and nice to watch. You've spoken on that about the, the difference between the, the coaching style you have to adopt in the States and the coaching style you have to adopt in in Europe and the way that they... Um, yeah, the way that there's, Europe and then there's Europe and then there's a f- French-speaking Europe. Okay. <laughs> man. God, I remember where I left now. Um, those fuckers don't speak English at all. I can say whatever I want because none of them are going to listen to this. <laughs> so uh, I get to Belgium. So the last camp at Invictus, the second one, right? In, in, it's in Rochefort near Brussels. I had to do, there was two ladies that didn't speak French. So in 28, that they basically don't want to speak English. So I had to do my entire thing in English for those two ladies. <laughs> And in French, for those 28 bastards that refuse to understand anything. French people go to school to learn English. So don't get, give me a fucking break. They can do this. They just refuse to speak English. I did my entire thing in French. On, and then CJ's presentation in English, I had to translate for them. That Sunday was the longest Sunday of my life. Know what I mean? And I'm like, I know you all can do better than this, right? So I was like, God... They just don't want to speak English. That's it. That's a problem. I mean, it's a segregated city, basically, uh, based on language. And so, whatever. And French people, I mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing the vlogs in French and, and everything, because otherwise, they, they are so far behind on CrossFit because of that. In what way? Uh, they don't understand the culture of CrossFit at all. The only window that they have onto crossfit is social media okay they don't watch videos they don't read the articles they just watch it on social media which as you know is excessively uh biased in certain ways and that is not the way you want to get your information so there is so many things they don't understand about the games like the questions we had sometimes were mind-boggling in the sense of they were asking stuff like well how come you know like the crossfit games at least they don't get hurt and so they don't do this, they don't do that. And I was like, wait, who said they don't get hurt? Well, they go back to training the day after. I was like, who said that? I had a guy literally asking me, well, you know, like the game athlete, they don't do all the strongman movements. So how do we know that your stuff works? There's, there's like six CrossFit Games athletes behind me. They all do my stuff. I, well, which social media are you looking at? <laughs> Um, have you seen pictures of George Bridget? I mean, because it goes on and on and on like that. And I realized, so the problem is they jumped into CrossFit and that's actually a problem throughout Europe, not just the French speaking. The French speaking countries are just behind compared to the English speaking ones, but there's still difference in Europe. Is they don't understand the intensity of CrossFit. Mm-hmm. That is a problem because CrossFit started with Grace, uh, Fran, all those very short, intense workouts. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think, Move toward the hero workouts at some point. That the, the Murph, all that bullshit, the long, longer, lots of volume and everything. But at least they started with the short, intense one. Like if I look at France, they jumped into it already in the hero workouts. So all their program is very long, but they're fucking slow as hell. And so they're doing Murph, but none of them can do great under two minutes. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like you're, the, the, to those guys that want to compete, I was like, can you do 30 plus rounds on Cindy? Because if you can't do that, why, why are we talking about doing Murph and stuff like that? And so I think there's a, um, we have to, I mean, in France, and I've that's why I want to do the vlogs in French, is I'm going to try to, to show them that culture of intensity first. Then you can go into volume, but you have to understand what it feels like to do friend in two minutes. Mm. You have to understand what it's like to do Grace in 110, to do 30 plus rounds of Cindy. All that stuff, they don't, they don't have it. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to 
uh, as always coaching the coaches to go toward that where they understand that culture of intensity, which I remember the definition of, of CrossFit, high intensity. Yeah. And everything is high volume anywhere. It's high intensity, functional movement, you know what I mean? So uh, the, the, uh, first of all, I think the whole high volume is wrong anyway. And on top of it, I think they skipped the, completely the intensity part. And that was very, very apparent to me in French speaking uh, language here. Uh, language, French speaking countries here, but that's a little bit of a theme I saw through Europe. It's because they came uh, later into CrossFit, they missed that part a little bit. And so, throughout all my my stay in Europe, I'm going to try to push that idea of intensity even more than I do in the States. Uh, I, I really like that. That's um, I'm, I'm seeing really big parallels between what you teach and, and Brian McKenzie's kind of core concept in power, speed, endurance, where it's skill and center and then intensity and then volume and how like especially endurance athletes have that completely the other way around they think by doing more reps, I agree with Grimaud. that's a great way of defining it yeah yeah, yeah totally that's i'm totally with this and i think they miss that they understand the skill but they go straight to like they don't understand barbell cycling mm. uh, for example like i was asking someone like can you do say great so can you do a set of 10 reps at clean and jerk 135 under 30 seconds because if you can't do that, why are we doing 30 minutes EMOMs? I mean, so barbell cycling is just not fast enough. Uh, it's like doing a CrossFit workout and you can't do keeping pull-ups. Yeah. Or butterfly. You, you're in trouble. No, I mean, and so before we go into those long workouts, we got to teach them barbell cycling. We got to, oh, oh, there's a culture there that have to be, I think we have to reset certain things and, and, and teach better the original CrossFit way. Mm. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spend a lot of time in Europe. Not right now, but like, I'm going to come back like, mm. a lot. I'm going to spend a few months a year in Europe, uh, probably based out of Holland because I, I like it here a lot. Uh, and, but this, on the coaching level, I'm going to, on top of everything I do, I'm going to go toward the, uh, teaching the intensity uh, culture that was present in CrossFit at the beginning, basically. That sounds great. Yeah, I can't wait to turn off and be thrashed by you. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> um, to take a bit of a side note, what would you say the signs of a, a good coach are? Good coach to me is still, um, I still, to me, a good coach, what it is, I go back to, uh, I remember in uh, The Empire Strikes Back, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Dagoba, where uh, Luke goes to train with Yoda, and he's about to enter the, the dark cave, and you ask him, what will I find? And Yoda, uh, I tell him whatever you bring with you. To me, a good coach is still that. He's someone who can look at an athlete and not bringing anything with him. It is, when, you, when you're looking at a coach, it's, it's not whether you're right or wrong. It's not whether, like me seeing what's wrong with your movement pattern does not help anybody. If I cannot explain it correctly, if I cannot make you feel the problem, understand the problem correctly, see for yourself, where the problem is, I failed because I will not change that movement pattern because for that to happen, you have to do the work. And so I see too many coaches that are concerned into selling templates, into selling their way. Like this is the best way to do it. This is, no, nah, man, it's not about you. It's not about you being dazzling. It's not about you impressing everybody. Uh, don't bring anything into the cave. I mean, focus, focus on people. We all do this as coaches to help people. I mean, I'm guessing, I'm hoping this is where everybody starts. And um, focus on people. Don't, fo don't focus on you. No, I mean, don't get stuck in the system. Don't get stuck in a method. Remember why you're doing this, to help people. So that should be always the first. The first thing for me is whenever I see someone, I always try to remind myself not to bring anything into the cave. It's not about me. Where did that come from? Have you always had that kind of that perception? Or have you, did you learn that from someone else, maybe another coach? No, it comes out of, um, to, to me, to be good at something, you have to know yourself first. I mean, Plato said it first, you know, know, your, know thyself. Uh, you need to know yourself first uh, on everything, like how do you do things. And I know what my motivation is, and it goes past coaching, it's in life. You know what I mean? Like my vocation, my obsession is getting better, whether it's me, whether it's others. It's always been like that. Since I'm a kid, I was 
the key for me was never, it's never a competition com compared to somebody else. But if I were to do something, I wanted to be uh, the best at it possible. And so it was always that obsession of bettering myself. And eventually it morphed into, but it, it wasn't enough because th that was a very selfish uh, quest. I, I found that the great, my vocation and the greatest pleasure that I get in life is out of that idea of bettering uh, humankind. And the best way to do that is one person at a time. Like if I can help my own way, because I'm not uh, smart enough to write like Nietzsche or stuff like that, but I found a way that I'm good at where I can help people with issues that they have. And pain can rob people's humanity because pain over time will break your soul. It'll break your mind, it'll break you. And so by being able to help people with that, I've always felt that I could make a difference in their life. And if I make a difference in their life, then I make, I make a difference with their kids, with their family, with their friends, with all of that. So being a humanist has always uh, cleansed my soul in a way, uh, even for myself. And so I know myself. I know what drives me in life. And I know it's that. It's being a humanist and everything. And so I, I know what I wanted to do. And being good with all this allowed me to do that. But if it wasn't with training, I would have found another way to do it. How are you? My core vocation. Yeah. How are you studying at the moment? You, like, because you, you strike me as someone who doesn't just um, just read in your or or educate yourself in your chosen field. Like you mentioned Plato before, and you have mentioned a few people throughout this that come from outside the field. Do you like? Do you draw from outside influences a lot? Ninety-nine percent. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's physics. I love to read and, and uh, watch videos about uh, quantum mechanics because it's a fascinating field. Like, I, I love those guys because uh, they're talking about something they don't understand. Like they say it themselves, you cannot understand quantum mechanics. It makes no sense in the, what they call the big world, like you know, the world outside of that, those, those tiny, tiny dimensions. To us, it makes absolutely no sense. Nothing works there like it works here. And so you cannot visualize what's happening. And yet, they manage to go further and further into the field through advanced mathematics, but basically following the data and everything. But every time, they have to reset their mindset. Mm. Uh, because if they assume anything, if they try to uh, put it in a way that they can understand, they're wrong. And so it's forced them to really look at the world in a way that is utterly... This uh, uncomfortable to them, basically. Like some of them, actually Einstein said that there's certain things in quantum mechanics they didn't like because it was spooky to him. He made him mentally uncomfortable. So he didn't even study, didn't go further than that into it because he was like, no, nah, that's spooky. Like, you know, he said famously, uh, uh, God doesn't throw dice because of the, uh, that, it, that had to do with the probability within the quantum mechanics and everything. Like there was an element of chance in it that he did not like, he wanted more like Newton laws, yeah. which you were know, predictable. Yeah. There's none of that in quantum mechanics. There's a huge amount of chance. And so he said, uh, God doesn't throw dice. Uh, so they, they, they deal with that mental discomfort all the time, following the data going forward and everything. And so we'll talk about not bringing anything into the cave. Those, those guys are the best example for that, where they can never bring their own experience into their work, like their everyday life experience. So imagine how mentally, the mental gymnastics that they have to do on a daily basis. So it fascinates me on top of the, uh, the awesomeness of quantum mechanics and everything. So uh, I read like everything about Einstein was a, uh, Einstein was a huge, uh, I don't want to say influence because he's so smart and I'm, I'm not, but um, he was a master at formulating complex problems into very simple questions. Yeah, that's was, from a young age, he was that. He could formulate things, uh, ideas that, that were so complex and yet in such simple terms that you go and ask, the, the, the thing he did he was the greatest ask is a question that he asked. He could encapsulate an entire excessively complex problem with very simple questions where right away you go like, huh? And so th th those are such powerful minds. I, I love to read about what they did and trying to catch a glimpse of the mindset. And uh, th th that's where I get most of my influence. On top of philosophy, because I've read a lot and all that stuff. Honestly, the amount of reading that I do throughout the fitness world is probably on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. 
I like a lot of people. I think it makes that's sense. As far as I go, it's like, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, why is credit 700? That's great. <laughs> and then back to reading math. You know I mean? <laughs> and, yeah. It's like, oh, that guy is really dumb. That's about <laughs> as far as it goes, honestly. In terms of philosophy, which are your kind of biggest influences there? And is there anything, like, you strike me as someone who would be a bit of a stoic, to be honest. Nietzsche. Yeah. All the way. Um, why is that? Greatest thinker to me. Uh, I don't know if you ever read a book where you felt the author wrote it for you. Yes. Okay. That was when I, when I read this uh, spoke the Artustra, I was, uh, I was 17 and I went six pages into it and freaked out. <laughs> and I would read the page at a time and it took me hours to recover mentally. Because I was like, um, I, I felt like I was doing drugs reading that book. It, it was, um, and I'm sure I didn't even understand the full philosophy of it or whatever, but it didn't matter to me because I felt he was writing that book on my skin in a way. Every sentence I read, I felt where he was talking to me were literally written on my skin. And so he had such a profound uh, influence on me even at the time it wasn't even the world it's just i just i, I just felt that book was written for me and he, he didn't i didn't even i didn't have to comprehend the world it wasn't that like he was changing my way of looking at the world as i was reading it but without without even a conscious decision it was, it's just i felt my brain waves changing as i was reading the book that's the best way i can explain it it's pretty powerful endorsement to go off and get that book right now. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. I read it again, like not so long ago, and it, it brought like uh, sensations that from way back then and everything. That's the best way I could uh, I could explain it is that I felt I was reading that book on a sensory level, like with my body and not with my mind, basically. Mm. Where, did the, the book. where did the love of books come from? Uh, my grandmother was a, actually at the PhD as a librarian. Okay. Nice. And uh, she always made me books. So actually, the, the best way to learn to read and not to read like ABC, like to read, is start with comic books because you're going to love it. And so I devoured every comic book there was. Like she always, she bought me the Asterix as a kid, Tintin, uh, all those, you know, French comic yeah. books I'm from Belgium technically, but all, all Asterix, I mean, there was Yakari, there was all those. So I read all of them because it was awesome. Then uh, eventually I moved to science fiction, read everything you can think of. I read like the Lord of the Rings like 21 times at least. So, uh, and then from there, it gave me that taste of reading. So I actually started after that to move to theater plays. I love to read theater plays. So I read all of Shakespeare, all of Moliere, uh, all of um, Cyrano of Bergerac. I read a lot. It's actually, it's a great play. Uh, the Musketeers, Three Musketeers, all that stuff you have to you have to read. It's actually it's beautifully written, really. And um, but it's a theater play first, and then from there I moved to our classical books because you know you just keep moving forward. And from there I fell into philosophy more, and then suddenly you're able to handle the volume of philosophy. If you try to read philosophy, it's like doing uh, Murph for the first time you do CrossFit. You yeah. can't handle the volume. You have to start with intensity and then you have to build volume. Remember what McKinsey says, skill, intensity, volume? Yeah. It's the same thing. Learn how to read, read crazy shit, and the books are awesome, and then you can build on the volume. It's exactly the same idea. So something that I've, I've picked up on is you speak multiple languages as well. Yeah. How did you go about learning those languages? I lived there. <laughs> yeah? Just immersed yourself? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I studied... Um, English and Spanish in school, but then English I learned in the States because when I got there, yeah, those nine years in school helped, but not that much, you know what I mean? And then um, I went to Brazil, I didn't, spoke, I didn't speak a lick of Portuguese. So I spoke Spanish, but not po Portuguese. But so I found my, uh, I met my ex-wife over there, right, who did not speak English. So I had to learn Portuguese real fast. <laughs> well, I have to say it was pretty cool because for the first six months, we never fought. Because I have no idea what she was saying. <laughs> so it was actually probably the best time ever. We spoke in bed and that was it. I mean, so it was awesome. 
Then I learned Portuguese and I was like, wait, what did you say two months ago when you, and that's when the problem started. <laughs> But so, but I learned uh, Portuguese by uh, in Brazil, basically. So that's it. So if I spend more time in Holland, I'm sure I'm going to learn Dutch. Good. Yeah. So the the other thing that's kind of or the the other big change I think in in your life since we spoke last has been the passing of Chris Moore, unfortunately. Yeah. How has that not only changed the way? you've done the seminars on a very kind of practical level, but how's like, he's, he's a man that like, just personally speaking for a second, he's a man that taught me a lot despite having a, an hour and a half like, interview with him and listening to the podcast. He, he's someone that like yourself comes across as a very kind of deep introspective person who helps and changes people. So how's he, I suppose what I'm asking is how's he changed you and how, like what have you learned from him? Well, it changed my life twice because the first time was with the Barbell Shrug pod podcast where uh, we talked, I mean, Charlotte uh, was the one who pushed to have me on the Barbell Shrug. And then we talked at the CrossFit Games and at the CrossFit Games, I mostly talked with Chris, actually. And I was explaining to him my system. He was like, no, this is awesome. And so he, they come and then the Barbell Shrug changed everything, at least in my career. I mean, so changing my career changed my life, obviously. Uh, and then after that, we, um, we stayed in touch. We kept talking. And I was moving to San Diego at the time. And then he lived in, you know, Carlsbad. Mm -hmm. So we started to, uh, I went to his house and we had dinner and everything. And basically, I would go and have either dinner or breakfast at, at his place like twice a week. And then the, my daughter would play with our kids, with his kids and, and stuff like that. And every conversation we had was never about business, was never about money. It was only about uh, how to help people. So philosophy, uh, crazy shit we did, and stuff like oh, like friends talk about. But most importantly, it was always about how to move forward, to help people, how to spread the message, what he wanted to do, what I wanted to do. And then we start from there. He was like, dude, you got to do the world tour. And at the time, I was just moving to San Diego. I was like, nah, man. I'm, I mean, it's not no, but I was like, I finally I'm making some money after struggling for so long. I'm, uh, life is easy right now. I mean, I mean. Uh, I'm in San Diego, life is easy, it's, uh, it's good. And he, but he's like, no, nah, man, you gotta, it's not enough. You got to spread the message. You, you, and so talking first, I was like, so the idea basically, so, so he made me go on to the second tour because at the time I was like, maybe next year. He was like, oh, let's do it this year because him, he wanted to move to England or Amsterdam. And so we're like, okay, but then we can, so we thought, talking about doing it together I was like okay together that'd be kind of cool like you because uh, he would do uh, we would do a podcast together the interviews all the time we would film like the entire trip we had we had so many stuff to make that trip like uh, so we would have content for the two of us to do stuff for the next three years together and everything and so that really pushed me toward doing that world tour and so and then I, it was one day I remember it was six in the morning uh, Charlotte called me and I'm six in the morning I'm like are, are you okay What's wrong? why are you calling me so early and she told me like you know Chris died and honestly the, the entire conversation was me saying what 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 and she was like Chris died what what do you mean what so that was like five minutes like this and uh, it's, to this day it doesn't feel real I, uh, I, I just still think like uh, I can email him or stuff like that so I but honestly, for the first months, he did not sink at all. I think he sunk a little bit when I went to his, to his memorial and the kids were there. Mm -hmm. Because then I realized that those kids are going to grow up without ever meeting him. That sunk, that sunk a little bit more the fact that he wasn't there anymore. But it's, um, I don't know, it's hard because he was so sudden. He's 35, heart attack. I remember, like, I think I talked to him the day before or like even that morning through emails we were talking about, because he was in Amsterdam, about Holland, and then what we were going to do moving forward. So it's one of those things where, I don't know, I just feel like uh, I lost contact with him, but him dead, I don't think I truly still understand that fact. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the, the, the kind of, one of the only saving things about it is the fact that he gave so much Oh, yeah. time, and he like, he helped so many people, and that was like the the only saving kind of grace about it. Look, he, he was doing exactly what he wanted. He was going to move to Amsterdam, have the studio, uh, interview people, and just try to make a difference, empowering people. So he 
he was about to do exactly what he wanted. So in that sense, this death is not, is not, very few people get to do exactly what they wanted. And he had the balls to jump. I mean, to leave Barbell Schwartz, uh, to leave the States and to jump to do exactly what he wanted. And so that's cool, man. He's, I mean, like, if I die tomorrow, I'm cool. That's why I, 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 I'm not, of course, I'm, as I lost my friend, so I'm very sad, but I'm not, I can accept his death in that sense. Like, I know that if I die tomorrow, it's all good. Because I've done a lot of stuff I wanted to do in life. I've built a life that, um, that is past what I thought I would accomplish, honestly. I'm doing more than I thought I ever would in a, in a field where I'm smarter than I thought I was. Yeah. Uh, and so if I die tomorrow, it's all good, man. I did more than I thought. And so I, I, I think he felt about the same way. Like that guy, you know, man's face and all that stuff. I don't think he envisioned that he would help that many people, that he would create that much change. So I'm sure that part of his spirit is at ease with it. Mm. He just sucks for us here, being without him, that's all. And so that's why I'm not sad for him. I'm sad for his family. I'm sad for his wife. I'm sad for his kids. So I always tell, like, I, I can't, I, I, I didn't go to the memorial to support him I, I, because I'll do that by continuing his message. Mm. And I know exactly what I wanted to do and I'll push that forward. I went to the memorial to support his wife and kids. Something you mentioned there was the idea that you've done more than you ever thought you could or dreamt that you could possibly do. Uh, yeah. At what point did that change? Did, was, there, was there a time where you go, actually, I can do this? Or was, was it like suddenly you just appeared there and it's like, oh, oh, all that hard work's played off? I still don't think I can do it. It's weird. Like um, doing all the seminars just to see so many people, like at the games, like people stopping me saying, hey, you just, I still don't understand. Uh, it's hard for me. I'm a very private person in a way. I know I, so I, I like to trash talk and to make uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, jokes all the time and I love doing the vlogs. I mean, in a way, I'm a very shy private person. Like, I'm, all, I'm never comfortable with when people come and say, oh my God, you Julien Pino, I want a picture. I love doing it because it's great to see that, but it's, I, I'm always very shy about it. Um, like, the interest, just the fact that I'm talking to 20 minutes on the YouTube and there's 3,000 people watching and then they leave all those comments and all those people telling me I made such a difference in their life and their training and all that stuff and it changed the way they look at certain parts of their life and everything, this part I still don't get. Like, it still doesn't feel, uh, I still feel I'm going to wake up tomorrow and then I imagine the whole thing. Mm. Uh, I, I don't get it. Like, I'm going to do like, so like we're cruising in Holland and then I'm going to do the seminar this weekend and there's so many people coming and they, they will actually want to hear me talk and all that stuff. I, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, even, but like, honestly, I look at the system that I created and I was looking at that, like the internal external rotation. And I was watching that on a picture on a, on a, on a board that was on, that some of my guy reposted. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's fucking smart. Mm. Uh, but I don't look at it like it's mine. I look at it like I just happened to write it. Yeah. But it was not mine. It's just a fact. I'm just the one who, for whatever reason, I seem to, uh, I managed to talk into, into simple terms, into simple questions complex ideas. Uh, so again, a little bit what Einstein in my own tiny way toward fitness, a little bit what Einstein was doing, which has really, that's what really intelligence is, is the ability to have those complex issues that you can solve by asking very pointed, simple questions. And that seems to be really what I'm good at is that it's just presenting all those complex ideas that nobody really wants to tackle. And I put them into simple terms where everybody can go, okay, that makes sense. We can move forward. So it's just, but that being said, the fact that I'm doing it, I'm always wondering uh, with all that stuff, how come there's not 10 people in the back saying, we've been figuring this out for 200 years. You're just late to the party, dude. I, that, that part, I, I still don't get. And so the fact that I'm doing all those seminars and everything, I, I, I'm like, awesome. Like right now, I'm in Utrecht. Uh, I'm in Holland and everything. We're traveling and we're doing all that stuff. And I'm going to go like you know, Australia and all that stuff. I, I feel I just, um, I don't know, it's, it's weird. Like, I feel I just using my grandparents' money to travel the world right now. I, I have a very hard time believing it's mine. <laughs> so, honestly, I don't know how I feel still to this day because I can't figure out that it's real. 
If you were going to tell the audience one thing, what would you tell them? Um, well, I, uh, understand the why and the how, not, not the what. Don't go into, in the fitness world, the biggest problem I see really is people focusing too much on methods and, and people are trying to sell you stuff. Like don't, like for example, a video that I love watching, I don't know if you've ever seen that, is The Day in the Life of Kai Green, the bodybuilder. Wow. You've seen that video? No, I haven't, okay. no. That, oh, you gotta watch this. It's called A Day in the Life of Kai Green. He's a bodybuilder, like he's been, he took second at Mr. Olympia, like the, three, three, the last three years running. And he has a video that he does about his day. So literally, they're gonna follow him his entire day. And he starts with his apartment, and he's not taking you to that uh, condo that he has in New York. He's taking you to that small apartment in a project that he keeps, where he spent the last 12 years struggling to become a pro bodybuilder. And he starts with, and then his entire 20 minutes is explained to you which Tupperware you should buy. Because you have to keep your food. So he starts cooking, and he's like, that's where people go wrong. And he shows you, and it's him cooking for 20 minutes, and putting it in Tupperware, and then he's taking you to the dollar store where he's buying his Tupperware, and which one you should get, because then you put it in a plastic bag, because otherwise they leak. And you go like, what the fuck? Because you know, everything else is glamour and bodybuilder, and then the huge mansion, and then they have six cars. Him is like, no, that's how you succeed. First, you're gonna put your food in Tupperware, because you gotta eat every three hours. And he goes through basically his struggle for the last 10 years, how he built up to who he is and everything. And that was such an inspirational video for me, because here's the guy who doesn't talk about what's in front of the camera. Yeah. And he's not trying to sell you a dream and a mirage, really, not a dream. A fucking like, you know, glitters and, and lies and everything. He's like, nope. The real life is I spent like 10 years in the hood struggling, not money, but my, cooking, my, cooking my sweet potatoes and my chicken, putting it in two power so I would eat three times a day. All the non-glamorous stuff nobody wants to hear about. And, it, and this entire day like this, and it was to me one of the most inspirational video there ever was because he showed his drive, the drive that he had towards success, what he really wanted to do. That was awesome. That's what you want to do when you want to succeed. Go look what's behind the camera. Do not believe social media. Don't just do your research. I mean, and for you French speaking bastard out there, learn English. <laughs> um, go, go. Go ask the right questions to people. Go. You got to want to learn how to fish. Stop asking for people to give you fishes. Go learn how to fish. Go learn what's behind the camera. Understand the process. Stop getting, being fed by all that. Inter First of all, ditch your TV and start writing a book. Yeah. And then after that, go learn the true information, the what matters. Whenever you read a training uh, system, try to understand the principles and not the, not the method and everything. And don't follow blindly anything because you want to be spoon-fed information. Stop that. Go, go, go be smarter. Go, go read and then stop being spoon-fed everything and go actually make, go make a decision on whether or not you want to believe something. But stop being spoon-fed everything. Oh. If you had just released that last bit, that would have been an amazing podcast. So um, that, that's awesome. And, and a question that I'm, I'm really eager to ask you is like, just because I'm interested, it will come out of your mouth. Is, is there something that you believe that others find controversial? That I believe that others find what? Controversial. Uh, well, the rotation thing. Okay, yeah, that's pretty big. That internal rotation? Okay, so uh, I don't understand that it's controversial. So yeah. that's where the gap is. To me, I'm like, duh. And they were like, huh. I'm like, huh, what? <laughs> Gymnastics. Any, it's, uh, so forget the internal rotation of the humorous. Let's just talk about that. That, that's, uh, that one, to me, it's like kindergarten stuff because it's so obvious. Mm. But um, internal rotation on the hinge. And the more I talk about it, the more I see people's face. And I'm like, and, but the, it, there's more interesting uh, point about that is how come in lifting, there is, we never talk about internal rotation, upper or lower body. I think it, it must be like a PT thing where they all like just, I don't know why they all want to, external rotation make them so hard. <laughs> that, that's the only thing they want to talk about always is external rotation. I find that part fascinating. 
that everything is always about external rotation. Maybe it's a Kelly Starrett thing, maybe it's a PT thing where they just, you know, again, they get rock hard every time they talk about external rotation. But there is never a talk about internal rotation in lifting. Did you see Usain Bolt sprinting? Yeah. Okay, I talk about it. That's not even internal rotation. That's adduction at that level. <laughs> he's, he's internally rotating hard, and then that, that's leading into adduction. But uh, it is so obvious to me, and yet in the fitness, I mean, the lifting world, we never seem to talk about it. Mm. I found that... Uh, fascinating that like everybody's accepting external rotation like it's a fact and yet internal rotation it seems like the body's not capable of it i found that very interesting yeah i'd love to um to listen to a conversation between you and kelly stress about that i think that'd be a fascinating three days sorry did you see what he said on joe rogan no i didn't okay so he's on joe rogan right and he's like uh, people, uh, at, so they don't see the video, but people at home, like he's basically putting his head facing the ceiling, right? His arms straight and he's engaging his lap and he's saying this is the strongest position possible for the shoulder. And Joe Rogan is like, well, how come when people knock each other, they turn their hands in? <laughs> and Kelly started like, was like, yeah, so let's talk about the squat. And, uh, and so, Okay, so this position, hand toward the ceiling, everything, is the strongest position for the shoulder. Do you bench press that way? No. Do you do push up that way? No. Do you do any movement gymnastics that way? No. Do you punch that way? No. Do you do anything that way? No. And yet, that's the best position for your shoulder. So, what are you saying? Like, we all get it wrong since for the last 100,000 years? Like we all been pushing with the thumbs, you know, in the point. So what are you saying? I don't even understand the concept. And it's basically being denied by every single thing you see in any sport. Mm. So what are you saying? Like, I don't understand. You know what the difference is between faith and science? The ability to make prediction. Okay. That makes sense. A prediction based on what you're saying would be that a pressing movement or at least holding weights would be stronger with my palm facing up in a supinated way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? In any shape or form, do you, can you imagine a movement, a pressing movement, where you're stronger supinated? No. I can't think of one. But yet that sounds logical to him. I, I suppose it's because... As you wind up, you feel your lap switch on and everything feels tight. That's a pull. That's not a push. Yeah, exactly. He's talking about, uh, if you tell me in a pull, it's better that way. Yeah, that's external rotation. But the shoulder is not just for pulling. That's what the lats are for. Shoulder is for, you know, raising and pushing forward, bringing the arm back. You're going to use, so you're talking for pulling, but what about everything else? I, and to, that, so I, that conversation, I think, would be very short. Then we'll, we'll go into the internal rotation to our deadlifting. I can't wait to have that conversation with him. Uh, regardless, I would love to see it. I think that should be videos. And, um, oh, it, that would be awesome. Clash of titans. Yeah. I don't think that long, lasts very long, but it'd be awesome to try. <laughs> so I think that's a, um, a great point to end up on. Um, thank yeah. you so much for coming on the show. But like, I'd like... As you can tell, I'm a huge like, fan of yours. I, I really think what you're doing is fantastic. Um, so I'd, I'd highly recommend people come and check you out at the seminars you're doing. Where can people find out a bit more about the seminars and uh, potentially buy tickets? Yeah, they can go on strongfit.com. I have the first one in Utrecht right now at the end of the week. And then the next one is Nuremberg. Then I'm going to Portugal and everything. So on strongfit.com, they can check all the links and all that stuff. But I'm going to post about it this week anyway. Oh, good stuff. Chances are there is one near nearby you, so um, it's definitely yeah. a good chance. So we're going to England, Northern Ireland, Austria, everywhere. Excellent, man. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Mindset RX podcast. Very soon, I'll be back with both solo episodes and new interviews. But if you enjoyed the show, please do me a favor and do the whole of the functional fitness community a favor and head over to uh, iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast and leave a five star review and some nice words too. You can find out more information about Mindset RX, our coaching, and the programs that we offer, as well as some more information about mindset in general at mindsetrx.com. So, my 
mindset romeo x-ray delta.com or alternatively and probably preferably for you guys you can head to facebook and search for mindset for functional athletes and in there you'll find a free group or by doing so you'll find a free group where you can keep up to date with all the best mindset advice for functional athletes so i'll speak to you very soon oh, 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 oh.